This is the 20 minute story of factories and smoke and sweat and toil and the half million men and women whose job happens to be electricity. The beautiful pictures on the screen now don't seem to have much to do with our job of work, do they? Well, things went along like this until suddenly one day not long ago, the whole electrical industry, every worker in the country in fact, was snapped into high gear. Here at Westinghouse, you'd work with two men on a Friday and come back to the job on Monday to find that you needed a dozen. Orders for wear overalls or store suits. We'd come on the job six days a week to punch in and take over from the night shift. Some of us draw a pay for putting our backs into it. Others for the know-how it takes to run a precision machine. Others for pushing pencils over drawing boards and figuring out the math. Others for meeting around polished tables in the executive department and tangling with the headaches of running a business at capacity. But whatever we are, big shots or little shots or old timers or rookies or technical men or executive men or muscle men, it's the same job. It's all part of the day's work. All right, now that you've met us, take a look at one of the places where we put in our time. It's big and it's efficient. It took the engineers more than a lifetime to design this right and develop it, so that the books are now calling it the American art of mass production. Well, it works. It's working harder than it ever worked in all history. And that brings me to the big point, the thing that lies beyond the job we do here. Well, most of us over here were still in bed. He rolled his tanks and guns and death machinery into Poland. Monday morning, while we were still asleep, we suddenly owned a port full of wrecked battleships at Pearl Harbor, and it took 2,000 American flags to cover the dead, you'll remember. And the lights of our cities went out too. It was the end of a thousand old ideas about how tough and safe we were. It was the end of a lot. But for us workers, it was the beginning. The beginning of the capacity strain we put on factories like these and the capacity strain the factories put on millions of us who work with our heads and our hands. And now let's get down to some of the jobs we do. If a new development involved with electricity comes along, of course, we have a lot to do with it because electricity is our business. After working out a group of the problems connected with fluorescent lighting, we put them into production. The girls turned out to be fine at these jobs, by the way. They know how to work rapidly without getting too rough with the materials. We test every single one of them before they're shipped. And this special device makes it possible to handle dozens at the same time. We started out on these with the idea that they'd go into homes and stores as well as factories. We had to change our plans, didn't we? These have been lifesavers to the blacked out factories that had to find better artificial lighting. And speaking of light, these big jobs were to turn electricity into light and shoot it 10 or 15 miles into the sky. We didn't have any wrong notions about what these babies were to be used for. But at the first, nobody dreamed how many we were going to have to turn out before we were through. And we're not through yet. You never can tell where following the trail of electricity will lead you. We'd been turning out x-ray tubes and parts for years, among the very best any doctor could buy, when suddenly orders came in for x-ray machines that could be carried around, ones that were portable, could be taken right out on battlefields. And so, of course, that became part of our day's work, too. Then binoculars. Not one person out of a hundred, probably, in this country could guess that one of the greatest electrical companies is making field glasses. But we had the men and women who knew how to do fine, delicate work, and we had the machines for it. So here we are, turning out binoculars by the thousand. So it's part of our day's work. This is how we make and assemble the parts of the precipitron. And that's something we like to pat ourselves in the back for a little because we believe it's going to be one of the enormously important improvements in the American standard of life. And because, of course, this happened to be invented in Pittsburgh up in the research department.
This machine draws the dust and oil particles and pollen out of the air while you are asleep or awake. And it was planned for peacetime homes and factories. That is, until the Nazis and Japs forced us to discover a thousand wartime uses for it. And this insecticide dispenser is another one of those things way outside of our main job of electricity. Scientists discovered that one of the gases used in refrigerators would work into a mixture safe for humans, but that would put bugs and mosquitoes out of commission for good. So part of the day's work now is to turn out an endless number of these. And we send them down to where malaria carries death to our boys. And they do save many a man's life. You know, it gives you a peculiar feeling to realize that nearly every job that comes under your hands nowadays is mixed up with life and death. But I'll explain that a little later. Because here come the places where we spend so much of our time. You earn your living in the shadow of the stacks, in the sound of crashing metal presses, or in the glare of the arc welder. And here we are, part of the 100,000 men and women of Westinghouse, literally piled up on the executive's desks. The call for more and more workers went ringing out all over the land. Day in and day out, training classes met. And men and women are boys and girls who've never had grease under their fingernails in their lives, now learn what it would mean to run a machine. You used to know everybody who worked in your department. Now the new faces showed up every day. Sometimes we had to teach the rookies in a few weeks what we'd been months or years in learning. And you should see the way the girls make good on these jobs, too. The executive employees met hour after hour over problems beyond anything they'd ever encountered. Because from the office boy to the boss, the pressure was on. For now, it becomes clear but at that time, in Washington and London, the leaders were planning that little surprise party for Hitler, and all hell was going to break loose in Africa. Of course, we didn't exactly know this, but that was what added so heavily to our work. And now we know that a part of the landing and the victory in Africa was born right in our plants, right under our own hands. And now another thing becomes clearer, too. Why the whole electrical industry tooled up and prepared so long before Pearl Harbor. It's management's job to look into the future. And what they must have seen in the future looked like a lot more work for all of us, because they began to prepare long in advance. At the heart of every need in the nation would lie the electrical industry. That was the great fact of the pre-war months. Our labor management committees saw the handwriting on the wall, too, which our industry had been carrying on for years. This was research. Take the ignitron here, for example. This development converts alternating current into direct current in enormous quantities. We'd worked on this so long that when the crisis came, we were all ready to supply them in quantity to industries everywhere. Then, when the enormous demand for more aluminum hit everybody between the eyes, the public learned that every pound of it had to be produced by electricity, by direct current. So that aluminum goes out in ever-increasing amounts today, headed for airplanes mostly, because, in part, the ignition we developed through the years was ready for the job. The research department sometimes seems like a lot of blue sky dreaming to the man who works with his hands. But this war has proved its value over and over a thousand times. This special device for finding out the hidden weaknesses inside metal and plastics, it might just look like a clever toy. Until you learn that because of this, manufacturers all over the world are going to redesign parts. And they say that even railroad tracks will be made differently in the future, because we're discovering what it is that wears them out. Yes, the research men spend a lot of time peering into the future. It was long ago when Westinghouse began to put the alternating current motor over. But we're using them now, and in quantities the boys over in Germany can't hope to match. This steam turbine, too, it was developed out of thousands of hours of research. And today, with every industry crying for more power, the whole country knows that it's a good thing to have around. A man could go on about research for months. It's a big subject. But I'll close this with one of the latest kinds. Research into the ideas of the thousands of us 
who have the practical jobs. The college boys have no monopoly on brains, said the bosses, and this was the result. And many a job is going faster and easier and more efficiently because of a slip of paper dropped into this box. All this then was our way of being prepared for the biggest day's work that ever hit American industry. The juice is still turned on full. And we know now that the job we did to help in Africa and Sicily is just a taste of the chore that lies ahead now. So here we come to the merchandise we're fixing up for Hitler and Tojo right this minute. You should see the size of the turbines we make and assemble now. Even George Westinghouse, where he's still alive today, might gasp at them. And the gears, too, complicated as a Chinese puzzle, yet accurate as a watch. But it's all in the day's work now. Nice job, don't you think? And deep in their insides are the things we made with our brains and our hands. These giant transformers, too, they confuse the visitor but the Navy loves them. No fighting ship could go down to sea without them. They transform the energy of the generators into fighting power. And lest I overlook the most generally used, most important piece of equipment of them all, here's the familiar electric motor. Without it, there just wouldn't be an American industry and no mechanized warfare. Life would go back a hundred years. Every electrical company makes them now, from tiny jobs you could hold in your hand to those that rise up before you big as a six-room house. And the girls nowadays, instead of making dainty little garments, they're making neat little bomb fuses. We improved upon the standard specifications for this job we made it better than the military even asked, and we made it for less money. Just in the day's work, and yet, it's a package full of hell for the enemy with love and kisses from the workers who made it. And they said if we could make generators big enough for Grand Coulee Dam, we ought to be able to turn out a gun big enough for this war. And here she is. And this is from us to you too, Schickelgruber, my boy. And the mounts for the guns don't look so these gun mounts apart in the Nazi laboratories now, trying to turn out imitations. But they're still as full of military secrets as the Casablanca Conference because we build electric brains into them. and send them over there with our compliments to the men behind them. And here's another part of our day's work. It fools the visitors because it looks so peaceful. But we know that the bloodstream of a bombing plane is electricity. And the thing that pumps it must be a generator that's light in weight. We scale pound after pound off the weight of this one. So that in place of the weight the old type electric generators took, the flying fortresses can load more gasoline and more bombs. It doesn't show, does it, looking way up there, the work we did, but it's there and it's a part of history. Radio equipment, of course, is right down our alley. And night and day around the clock, we bend over the work and make the perfect parts it takes. has to be made right, of course, because every detail may mean that some boy whom we will never see will owe his life to the equipment we made. Even making the instruments that glow on the panel before the pilot is all a part of our day's work. And because they have to be hairline accurate, the girls laboriously turn each one out by hand. Neat work, don't you think? Neat work to lie before a brave man's eyes and tell him at a glance the story of his airplane. And take these helmets that we're making by the hundred thousand. 
It gives you an idea of why the electrical industry is so big and complicated that no one man can completely understand it all. Our research worked out of plastic years ago. And here it is now, forming shields around the heads of every man who faces combat. his steel helmet, the single most precious possession a soldier ever has. We'll never meet these boys, we millions who work for them, but that's all right. That plastic helmet liner is a part of us, too. This is the last one we'll show, the test for a torpedo tube. A torpedo costs about as much as a fine automobile, and it has cost the Japs many a ship. But because in our industry you've got to know you've made things right, they first see action like this. And the last time they see action, it's like this. Death in every one of them. Here is electricity, the unleashed power of 66,000 volts. Electricity to work for man in peace or in war. Electricity, death to the enemies of freedom. And that's what we mean by the hundred thousand of us and our day's work. Then one day, you remember, the officials came in from Washington to give us the Army and Navy E. And the executives marched in smiling. And thousands of us got into this movie at last. And yet, while they were making their speeches, you could look up and see the flag, familiar as these awards have become, and it really meant something to you. You know, somebody probably put in a day's work sewing that flag together. And somebody else probably made this one, too, all in his day's work. Although I understand that more than a million men have made it their day's work to die for it at one time or another. It means something. And this, too. The executives planning it, the engineers and designers and architects putting it down on paper, and the mechanics and painters and carpenters putting it up against the sky. It was just in the day's work, but it meant something. This was a job, too, that meant something. Somebody got paid for building this, and he was glad to get paid, but it meant something more to it. And that's part of how we feel about it. We do our day's work, and we get paid, so that we could look after our families and take it easy now and then and give the kids something. That's it, the kids. Give them a good education in a free country where a man can shoot off his mouth and speak his mind without going to jail for it. It's all in the day's work, but it means something. And this, after all, is what it means. And thus the story of the millions of us Americans who work with our brains and our hands in the day's work that spells victory.